Welcome back, everyone. I hope you got some lunch. There's still more food out there if you need uh, refreshment later. Um, it's my pleasure um, to introduce Dr. Janice Johnson. Um, Dr. Johnson is um, at BYU here and is going to be introducing this next session. Um, Dr. Johnson has a PhD in American history from the University of Leicester. And she is currently the Laura F. Willis Faculty Research Associate at the Maxwell Institute here at BYU. Um, Dr. Johnson's own work concerns um, the reception history of early editions of the Book of Mormon. And so she gets to read all the fun things people write in the margins of their books. It's a really fascinating work, and um, we look forward to seeing more of it. Janice? Um, I'm going to introduce both of our speakers in this session separately. So we will start with Hasia Diner. Um, she is the Paul and Sylvia Steinberg Professor of American Jewish History at NYU, at New York University. She's an expert in immigration and women's history who has written extensively in those fields and in the history of, of the Jews in the United States. Um, Hasia has written 12 books and dozens of articles, um, including Aaron's Daughters in America, which looked at Irish immigrant women in the 19th century. Her works praise her, a history of Jewish women in America. Um, her book, We Remember with Reverence and Love, American Jews and the Myth of Silence After the Holocaust, which won the National Jewish Book Award and uh, was also a winner of the Saul Viner. Prize um, in American Jewish the, the, Amer, from the American Jewish Historical Society, um, and also her book *Hungering for America: Italian, Irish, and Jewish Foodways in the Age of Migration*, which relates most specifically to our discussion today. Um, on a personal note, Hasia has had an incredible influence on a good friend and colleague of mine who still talks about Hasia's work and her ability to pay attention to Jewish women while considering the overall arc of centuries of history in astounding detail. Hasia. So first, let me be, can you hear me? Okay, how about now? Okay, great, thank you. So first I wanna begin uh, by thanking uh, the conference organizers uh, and uh, to say how uh, moved and honored and in a way humbled I am as a true outsider um, to have been uh, invited here and to think that somehow uh, my voice might uh, matter. So uh, we have um, a tall order for this session. It is a session uh, built around uh, certain key words, revelations, authority, material culture, okay, all in 20 minutes. Um, and those four um, framed around the obvious historical reality um, that uh, there has been uh, a close connection uh, between women and food. To know any community, large or small, to understand their, its, uh, any community system of meaning, its boundaries and its bridges, um, its driving forces for organizing uh, everyday life, we should look to food. Uh, food uh, will reveal to us the structures of relationships and the tempo of life daily, weekly, seasonally. And in that context of thinking about uh, the centrality of food in life on an ongoing basis, and certainly food in history, we should train our eyes and wrap our brains around the fact that at most times, in most places, and dare I say all, or at least all that we know about, women have had responsibility for the basic pro uh, processes of feeding, of, of feeding of providing the calories which have stoked the bodies of her family to keep their lives going and uh, to ensure the continuity of life. How did they do that? And how does that offer us a window into um, history? 
Now, uh, to say that women have played this uh, fundamental uh, role in the food process, I'm not saying that men were uninvolved. Um, in fact, as a bad metaphor for somebody who does Jewish history, I'll use it anyhow and to say that in most cases, it was a man who brought home the bacon. Uh, not that men uh, did not have, in many societies, supervisory roles in uh, the many steps involved in getting that food into the kitchen and into the pots, um, but the mundane, quotidian, everyday, so self-obvious as to seem uh, perhaps unnoteworthy, uh, but yet uh, transformative and magical tasks around uh, the uh, transforming of raw into cooked. Can hear a nod to the cultural anthropologist Claude Levi Strauss, who essentially launched um, the uh, field of the study of food and culture. It those lay in the hands of women. By studying that phenomenon across time and place in the multitude of ways in which women did that and the means through which they exercised authority by virtue of their constant manipulation of food is a vast subject. I would, uh, to say the least, not uh, stand up here and claim expertise in every one of the times and places because that is the entirety of human history. Um, so I know a little bit about a small part of the story, uh, but I think that even that those small parts are a revealing of the larger trend, the, su the larger history. The, trend, the subject of food, women, and authority, on the one hand, unites historians in as much as there was no time or place from the most uh, ancient of worlds that we have records of to the very day that we are in right now, um, that food, uh, the, the involvement of women in food uh, unifies all of those histories. But on the other hand, it also divides them because uh, how it played itself out was always different depending on a variety of circumstance. And here I want to give a nod to Laurel Ulrich, who in her um, uh, book, uh, Good Wives, uh, in three words said it all, context is everything. And um, I don't think there's a course I teach in which I don't quote you. It doesn't matter what the subject is. So context is everything. So uh, what are those contexts in which we want to think about the many, uh, one might say, countless uh, uh, ways in which women um, have uh, been involved in the world of food and how we need to historicize it? So first is the question of um, the available technology at uh, her, uh, literally, fingertips to get the food, to preserve it, to prepare it, to distribute it. That is a history of uh, changing uh, technology. It is also a history of the changing accessibility of foodstuffs from uh, the ways in which in uh, pre-modern societies, uh, people were, women were limited to making their magic in their uh, uh, kitchens um, through food that was only locally available. Uh, to, again, the moment in which we live where um, we can get um, in New York uh, strawberries in the middle of the winter. Uh, um, it doesn't matter where those strawberries come from, they are in our supermarkets. So the accessibility of uh, foodstuffs uh, by which women can uh, do their food work. We need to, in terms of context, think about um, the class spectrum. Where along the class spectrum did our subjects uh, uh, find themselves in tr and how did where they found themselves on the class spectrum impact the ways in which they could do that work of taking uh, the raw and transforming it into the cooked. Uh, we need to think of the uh, range of literally things that they had, uh, be they uh, pots or pans, dishes or forks, spoons or knives. Um, these were uh, not the same in every place. And what was considered absolutely central to uh, cooking and serving a meal varied by what uh, those uh, things were that were defined as essential. 
And I think very appropriately here, we want to think about the way in which community structure and uh, in many cases, uh, religious uh, dictates uh, uh, defined the world, or divided the world into the forbidden, okay, and uh, the acceptable into the everyday and the celebratory. So those were different in different societies. Whether thinking about uh, getting food and preparing it um, in um, societies based on uh, hunting and gathering, on subsistence farming, um, to uh, more industrially uh, um, organized societies which gave women the chances of canning, preserving, baking, frying, running off to the supermarket in their car to get highly processed foods or foods from exotic places, or ambling through a farmer's market to pick out the uh, best locally made cheeses or jams, sausages or breads, women's work cannot be disassociated from the work of food, but it has to be historicized. No situation uh, is exactly like any other. Women's history cannot be understood without asking, and I'm gonna ask a string of questions, and there is, to say the least, no one answer. In any given uh, moment in time, in any given place, which women made the food? When, how, and for whom? Was it the housewife? Was it the servant? Was it the daughter? Was it the daughter-in-law? For whom did they cook? Did they cook only for, them, for their family? Did they cook for their employees? Did they cook for their neighbors? Did they cook for members of their community who found themselves in need? Did they cook for strangers? Did women uh, get money for their cooking? That is, did they were, had an ability to translate their cooking skills and cooking activities into uh, commercial uh, um, ventures? How did women find ways in times of scarcity to make do? And how did their ability to do so ensure or at least make them uh, set them on the road to uh, survival during difficult times? When and where have women cooked in groups? And how did, their, did new living arrangements alter communal food preparation? Certainly the issue of uh, rural to urban migration changed the way in which uh, women uh, interacted with each other over uh, matters of food preparation. How did women as migrants, and here this is the subject that um, I'm probably most familiar with, but how did women as migrants navigate the novelties of the new ingredients and new modes of preparation that were available in their home, in their new homes, and how do they navigate that um, or negotiate that um, and bet between that and the remembered foods of back home? How did they balance the new and the assumed uh, 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 foods from that they had grown up with. How did state policy okay, or uh, other forms of authority structure limit or expand which, that which they could cook? And how did women operate within uh, male-made uh, power structures about what to cook and to whom to serve it? How did women in this place or that place use fo food to enhance their um, status uh, for themselves and for their families. How did women, for example, sell themselves um, uh, as attractive marriage partners by virtue of their um, cooking reputation, their reputations for cooking prowess? Um, when and how did women, kitchen by kitchen, table by table, challenge authority and cook what they wanted not necessarily what they believed they had to cook. To whom did women t go to to uh, enhance their cooking knowledge? Did they go to mothers, mothers-in-law, uh, the older women in the community, to cookbooks, to cooking schools? Okay, all of these were historically uh, dri uh, driven. And finally, in this string of questions, although the questions could go on, how did women's quest for autonomy and personhood conflict 
or not uh, with um, their uh, work in uh, the field of cooking and feeding their families. So I'm going to be drawing this to a close and just say that there is obviously no one answer, but these and so many other uh, questions offer us a way to link the histories of women with their many uh, contexts. Each was a different context, but each one of these stories, each one of these answers, or each one of the answers to these questions serve as a kind of universe unto themselves um, that bind together very directly um, that which we see everywhere, which is uh, the deep and tight bond between women and food. So uh, we could name a place, name a time, and I, yesterday in the sessions, we looked at so many parts of um, the world, at uh, Mauritius, and at um, uh, Haiti, and at uh, Rwanda, and uh, uh, England, and the United States. And each one is a place that has a story to itself. And each time period has a story to itself. So I would hardly be so arrogant uh, to say that I could tell you about all of them. But rather, I hope that this would be a kind of spur to in all the projects that the younger scholars are doing, as well as uh, those of you who are embarked on your, your own uh, historical research to put food in. Okay, so um, I might end with a, um, an aphorism that I made up, but it's not that clever. Uh, the food women made, made history. Okay, the history of women has always been the history of food. Thank you. Thank you, Hasia. I think that we, we've got enough questions there to last um, us for quite a, while, uh, quite a long time. I think she crammed a semester's worth of questions into 20 minutes. Um, lots for us to, to digest. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, I will now introduce Kate. Um, Kate Holbrook is the Managing Historian of Women's History at the Church History Department. Um, she received her PhD from Boston University and her, her dissertation is called Radical Food, um, Nation of Islam and Latter-day Saint Culinary Ideals, 1930 to 1980. Kate has authored and co-edited a number of articles and book chapters about Mormonism house, and housework, the Nation of Islam, Muslims, um, Latter-day Saints and Food, Religion and Sexuality, and Religious Hunting Rituals, which I was unfamiliar with, so I'm totally going to go look that one up. Um, as well as um, three major book publications, The First 50 Years of the Relief Society, Key Documents in Latter-day Saint Women's History, At the Pulpit, 185 Years of Discourses by Latter-day Saint Women, and Women in Mormonism, Historical and Contemporary Perspectives. Um, Kate and I can always connect over women's history and always connect over food. Um, and so I am excited for all of us to, to hear Kate today. Um, and if you ever get to, um, if Kate ever has the opportunity to gift you some of her quince jam, do not look at it weird. It is, it's amazing. It's a phenomenal thing. So Kate. Thanks very much, Janice, and thank you, Professor Diner. Professor Diner was laying out large questions and systems and ways of thinking about food and women's history, and I'm going to take a narrow look at Latter-day Saint women and Jell-O and see what that more narrow look, in, in light of the broader look, uh, what that can create for us in our, in our thinking. And I wanted to thank Amy Chopin, who's an academic intern at the Church History Department this summer, for adding some real some actual jello texture. I'm not sure if <laughs> this was real jello that's ended up on these slides. Um, so she, she's starting a master's degree in history at the University of Utah this fall, and clearly from her PowerPoint skills, but from a lot of other reasons, she's a, she's a person to watch. Not long after moving to Utah, I started a cooking group with some women in my neighborhood. It was a diverse group in terms of life stages, which made the cooking especially interesting. We met once a month and had a theme for each session. For some meetings, we would have a cooking demonstration to model a special technique. 
but usually there was a theme, such as yeasted breads or soups, and several of us would bring samples of our favorite recipes that fit that category, as, along with typed copies of the recipe. The evening that we focused on salad recipes, an unusual salad joined the mix. An especially generous older member of the group had brought a salad that would have been sophisticated when she was in her 20s, but it no longer made immediate sense to the younger women among us. Since we couldn't make sense of it, it didn't taste very good to us, because understanding food has a lot to do with our emotional experience of the taste of food. This sad salad had embedded canned tuna and a collection of savory vegetables in green jello. If I didn't think if if I didn't think about the jello as an historian of food, then I would have misinterpreted the jello and failed to recognize it as a gift that she had brought to our group. I have chosen to talk about jello today in honor of Laurel Thatcher Ulrich, not because I have seen her make it or eat it but because she has made such strides in teaching us how to look closely at an object to unfold its layers of meaning. In the field of history, one of the analytical errors many of us seek to avoid is presentism, by which we mean talking about something that happened in the past according to the way we understand it today. Presentism is easy to do when you're thinking about the standards of the past as though the way we understand the world today should have been obviously right to the people in the past. Lynn Hunt, past president of the American Historical Association, put it this way, quote, presentism at its worst encourages a kind of moral complacency and self-congratulation. Interpreting the past in terms of present concerns usually leads us to find ourselves morally superior, so comfortable. Our forebears constantly fail to measure up to our present day standards. Now, I don't want to read that quote without also saying that certainly some things we consider morally wrong today were also morally wrong in the past. It's an important thing that we grapple with in the discipline of history. But in other cases, the moral high ground we claim over our ancestors is unstable. For example, today many people take pride in owning few possessions and streamlining our approaches to domestic life. We might sneer at mid-century American women who frequently washed and ironed tablecloths for their family meals. What a waste of time. Presentism lives in that act of sneering. Engaging in presentism is also a temptation when we write about objects. Many objects mean something different today than they did even 50 years ago. Foodstuffs mean something different today than they used to. So now we are back to thinking about what the green jello tuna salad might have meant when my neighbor first learned to love and eat it. Today's American tastemakers, with their devotion to whole foods simply prepared and eaten in season, often reject jello outright. And American eaters have forgotten what it meant when their ancestors first made jello's acquaintance at the beginning of the last century. What it meant then was a radical democratization of elite culinary traditions. Several companies were making gelatin convenience products during the last decade of the 19th century, and these products soon came to perform in recipes as gelatin had for the wealthy in centuries past. In previous centuries, you had to be rich to gain access to gelatin. A team of servants had to start with calves' feet or deer antlers chopping, scraping, boiling, and skimming for most of a day to create the gelatin for a French noblewoman's aspic or a Russian royal's chaladets. Flavoring gelatin with savory ingredients such as meat or tomato and suspending foodstuffs in a translucent medium was what gelatin was for. It wasn't sweet, it was savory. Mrs. John E. Cook won third place in a 1905 Knox gelatin recipe context, contest for perfection salad up here, which was cabbage salad suspended in gelatin. Now, when Pearl Waite invented the first exciting and affordable gelatin flavors, which his wife May named Jello, he further brought elite culinary traditions within the reach of everyday people. 
and those everyday people often used Jell-O for savory concoctions, just as the wealthy had done before them, and as my neighbor did for cooking group. Her salad was an indication of high culture. Latter-day Saint Jell-O consumption has been, overwhelmingly, in salad form, and this was true of Jell-O consumers throughout the United States. Molded Jell-O salads were all the rage by the 1930s, and their popularity lasted for decades. In fact, green Jell-O was initially developed in 1930 expressly for use in making molded salads, contributing a citrus element to the traditional savory options. Molded salads were fancy. True to the gelatin pedigree of aristocrats, Jell-O concoctions were intended to impress and delight. Although Jell-O had been tooted since its inception as easy to make, molded salads required expertise, and they took hours to set. Has anyone made a mistake with Jell-O? <laughs> I'm raising my hand because I have two. Practice was necessary to make diced fruit, vegetable, or meat bits hang throughout a mold instead of all falling to the bottom. Jell-O also had to set just the right amount before receiving additions such as mayonnaise, whipped cream, sour cream, or cottage cheese. When it set too little, the cream would melt or turn into particles. If it set too much, the Jell-O wouldn't combine well and broke into pieces. Unmolding the salad loomed as an additional potential disaster. I just wanted to show you these molds. There, there's a lot, lot of things for the Jell-O to stick to in these molds. Uh, 30 minutes before the meal began, you couldn't do it much earlier than that, with no way to hastily recreate a dish that required hours to set, the cook had to coax the salad out of its mold without leaving any of it behind, without it breaking, and without it ending up off center of the platter, because once it's on the platter, it does not move. <laughs> Both Jell-O authorities and Jell-O misfits all know the ways in which a molded salad was not easy. Due in part to all of this fuss, many women combining professional work and family, or just trying to reduce the burden of housework during the 1970s and then into the 80s, abandoned molded salads. Jell-O lost its social cachet around this time, and the opportunity to use Jell-O as an avenue to belittle its consumers was born. However, two-thirds of the recipes in Latter-day Saint cookbooks, community cookbooks, and this is from Mormon country cooking, still had recipes, plentiful recipes, for molded salads. In one fell swoop, jello salads could represent domestic enslavement, perfectionism, developmental regression, or in holdout communities, celebration, and community members' love in tangible form. Latter-day Saints were not the only Americans who continued, Latter-day Saints in the United States were not the only Americans who continued to eat Jell-O salads after they had lost their high status. Jell-O traveled well, cost little, and appealed to a wide range of palates, from those for whom chewing or swallowing caused difficulty, to those who delighted in its translucent, quivery sweetness. It was ideal for delivery to an ailing community member, a family welcoming a new baby, and especially communal meals. Just as Utah Latter-day Saints recognized its utility in such situations, so did many American Protestants, and they too found humor in its consumption. A woman posting a Jell-O salad recipe to an online forum for expectant parents wrote, I'm Methodist, and we always joke that you can't have a Methodist potluck without at least a couple of Jell-O salads. The 1979 Marysville United Methodist Women's Cookbook does in fact have recipes for pretzel jello salad, asparagus salad made with green jello, and mint salad made again with green jello. According to Pew data, Iowa, Utah's main competitor in jello consumption, <laughs> is bursting with churchgoers. Jello and church functions worked well together. During the 1980s, the Jell-O Corporation tried to reinvent their product's image, emphasizing it as easy to prepare rather than elegant. 
Jello preparation was simpler. Fewer people made complicated molded salads, and one could buy it now already prepared in a little cup with a tin foil cap. This was also uh, the era, the heyday of North American diet culture. So Jell-O emphasized its fat-free nature and developed low-calorie and sugar-free varieties. In 1999, Iowa beat Utah for Jell-O consumption. And this is when, con um, Maybe it's not obvious, but this is when it became more intractably associated with Latter-day Saint culture. And this is because of the work of some men. A chef who was not a church member, Scott Blackerby, is part of the reason. As executive chef of Salt Lake City's high-end restaurant Bambara, Blackerby playfully objected when Utah lost to Iowa. He waged a take back the title movement. <laughs> that included a jello sculpting contest, and he put his own jello innovations on Bambaro's menu for a summer. And these were not at all like the jello salads and jello influenced desserts that uh, women were making. These were something very different. BYU communications major Jeremiah Christentot picked up on the effort, and he launched a successful campaign to make jello the official state snack food that same year. And it is. Blackerby and Christentot thus paved the way for the 2002 Olympic Jell-O pin. They did not make, there were a couple of pins. They did not make the Utah Latter-day Saint and Jell-O connection up. It was evident in church cookbooks and family traditions and in insider jokes. What the contest, the Jell-O legislation, and the Olympic pin did was to further a few careers while also projecting a concrete link between Utah ch church members and Jell-O. Lapel pins are part of the Olympic cultural experience produced to represent the hosting community. And generally, one pin becomes more popular than the others. For the 2002 Olympics in Salt Lake City, the runaway favorite pin featured green jello. And enthusiasts paid $150 or more for pins that originally cost only $7. Every few years since 2002, someone writes about Latter-day Saints and Jell-O, and invariably they mention this Olympic pin as evidence of some profound truth about Latter-day Saint culinary traditions. The pin thus became a popular medium for expressing messages about Latter-day Saints, and these messages were sometimes apt and other times inaccurate. For some church members, the pins reinforced unkind stereotypes, while others found them reassuring. I find them misleading. Not only did bare green squares of jello on the pin suggest that Mormon jello was plain, the squares also represented jello as easy to prepare. Jello in plain square form was what you met in hospitals and grade, square, grade school cafeterias, but Latter day Saint jello preparations were not simple and plain like that. The second incarnation of the Olympic jello pin added grated carrots to the jello. The carrot depiction was more accurate than plain squares because it was more like salad, and it had shown up on dinner tables. But here is a lesson about women's history. Green jello and carrots is what people referenced when they wanted to make fun of jello and implicitly the women who prepared it. And people made fun of shredded carrots in jello far more often than they actually made it or ate it. What, church, what Utah church members really liked about their jello was mixing it with cranberry and nuts at Thanksgiving and with fruits and dairy at other times of celebration. While it might be funny, the green jello and carrots pin is also misleading, not because no one ever ate it as an attempt to get her family members to eat their vitamins, but because reducing jello salad to green jello and carrots is a distortion of the women behind the jello. Ordaining green jello and carrots as the mascot of women's salads make these women look like they don't care for others' culinary pleasure. In fact, the opposite is true. Why bother to put regular food in jello if not to increase eaters' delight? This kind of derision further discouraged jello salads among the women of Generation X. Popular food bloggers have distanced themselves from Jell-O. For example, the women behind the Our Best Bites blog list the one Jell-O recipe in their first cookbook under gelatin instead of Jell-O in the index. But for millennials, we might have a different story. The Sun family immigrated to the United States from China about 20 years ago. 
and only recently moved to Salt Lake City, where two of their three children joined the church. Last fall, the family joined us for Thanksgiving, where I served a ruby red raspberry jello salad in an old fashioned cut glass bowl topped with freshly whipped cream. Anna's son, the oldest daughter, asked me what the situation was with church members and Jell-O. She had been a member of the church for about four months, and I told her a bit about it. An energetic and extremely capable computer programmer in her 20s, Anna went home and read about Jell-O. She decided to experiment. In her words, I was is particularly intrigued by molded Jell-O salads because they sounded so retro, and I'm really into that kind of thing. I'm so happy that I joined the church and mastering the molded jello seemed like the perfect way to dive into the culture. <laughs> For any of you who haven't noticed, retro is chic and so is Anna. She is chic in spades. She created magnificent concoctions and even fantasized about opening a jello cafe. This picture is a jello dessert she made and brought for us. The base is alternating layers of mango and coconut made with mango puree and coconut milk and plain gelatin. She didn't actually use jello. The top is just water and sugar and gelatin set with orange slices and raspberries. She wrote, it turns out that you can turn pretty much anything into jello as long as you melt it, puree it, or boil it, and the flavor possibilities are endless. So, but this is getting extra complex. You don't even have the jello to help you to flavor the, the gelatin. Jello has signified different meanings at different times in Latter day Saint history, from the culinary democratization of elite foods during the 1930s, to a consecration of family tradition during the middle decades, to a faux pas in the 90s. In a way, Anna's creation has little to do with that of her mid century spiritual forebears. She flavored the gelatin herself instead of using jello. She made it small, enough for one or two people to share, and not enough to feed the masses. At the same time, however, it is a direct descendant of her spiritual forebears' efforts. This millennial gelatin was about play, beauty, creativity, and embracing a religious cultural legacy. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Um, that was lovely and gave me some important context. Um, of five, five years ago now, I moved to Rexburg to be a professor at BYU-Idaho and realized that jello salad, salad was one of the st standards you had to, if you were going to contribute to a funeral meal or anything, you had to know how to make je jello salad. And I very quickly found out that I did not know how to make jello salad, that this thing that I had mocked was m way more complex than I had ever understood. <laughs> um, thank you. That was, that was lovely.